Our second scripture reading, our gospel reading for this morning, comes from the 22nd chapter of Matthew. Jesus is in Jerusalem. It's just after Palm Sunday. He has cleansed the temple and has left and then has come back in the following days. And today's reading is part of a section where various opponents challenge Jesus and attempt to trap him, and there will be a few more after today's uh, before they finally give up and resort to arresting Jesus later in the week. Listen for what the Spirit may speak to us through these words. Then the Pharisees went and plotted to entrap Jesus in what he said. So they sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you are sincere, and teach the way of God in accordance with truth, and show deference to no one, for you do not regard people with partiality. Tell us then what you think. Is it lawful to pay taxes to the emperor or not? But Jesus, aware of their malice, said, Why are you putting me to the test, you hypocrites? Show me the coin used to pay the tax. And they brought him a denarius. Then he said to them, Whose head is this and whose title? They answered, The emperor's. Then he said to them, Give therefore to the emperor the things that are the emperor's, and to God the things that are God's. When they heard this, they were amazed, and they left him and went away. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. In the time of Jesus, the area of Palestine was a colony under Roman rule. Uh, Rome allowed a a fair amount of uh, self-governance, but they maintained ultimate authority. The Romans levied heavy taxes, a burden that often fell especially on the poor. Uh, and many detested the Roman presence. They were weary of the taxes and the armies, and open revolt, a revolt and rebellion broke out against Rome around the time of Jesus' birth and would break out again 30-some years after his death. But at the very same time, there were many Jews who found Roman occupation quite beneficial. Uh, Romans had brought peace and security in a very turbulent area. Commerce benefited from the Roman presence. And, And besides, other than a few fleeting moments here or there, Israel had been occupied by some foreign power for centuries. Now in today's gospel reading, pro-Roman Herodians become unlikely partners with the Pharisees in an attempt to trap Jesus. Normally, Pharisees and Herodians would have nothing to do with one another. But here they join forces in an effort to get Jesus to make either a pro-Roman or an anti-Roman statement and get himself in trouble. Tell us then what you think. Is it lawful to pay taxes to the emperor or not? Now, this question is perhaps more difficult and more volatile than we may at first realize. The the tax in question could only be paid with a Roman coin, like the the coin I have placed on the cover of our bulletin. This particular one's inscription says, Augustus, or Caesar Augustus, son of God, father of his people on one side, and on the other side it says Tiberius Caesar, son of Augustus, high priest. Now, for the Pharisees, who 
were meticulous in trying to keep the commandments, this coin with its divine pretensions and its graven image violated a couple of them. And Pharisees objected even to using such coins. Perhaps that's why they needed the Herodians with them. And yet our scripture reading simply says they brought Jesus a denarius. They would seem to include the Pharisees. Strange that they appear so unfazed by this idolatrous coin. Whose head is this and whose title? Jesus asked. That's certainly not in dispute. It's the emperor's. Give therefore to the emperor the things that are the emperor and the things to God that are God's. Some of us learned it slightly differently in an older Bible translation. Render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's. And speaking of different Bible translations, I'm not really sure why our Bible translates Jesus' question, whose head is this? The word that Matthew writes in his gospel is the same word he finds in his Bible in the creation story where God says, let us create humankind in our image. Whose image is this? When the emperor Augustus or Tiberius put their image on a coin, it is an explicit statement about whose coin it is. It's not all that unlike the branding that companies do in, in our day when they plaster their name and their logo on their buildings and their equipment. Whose image is this? Give therefore to the emperor the things that are the emperors and to God the things that are God's. But as so often happens when opponents try to trap Jesus, he does not actually answer their questions. Jesus does not say what things belong to God and what things belong to the emperor. Does the image on the coin really make that coin the emperor's? And what of the image of God that we all bear? The earth is the Lord's and all that is in it, the world and those who live in it. So begins Psalm 24, a psalm that Jesus no doubt knew well. Whose image is this? Give therefore to the emperor the things that are the emperor's and to God the things that are God's. In just over a week, it will be the 500th anniversary of Martin Luther nailing up his 95 theses on the, the church door and inadvertently sparking the Protestant Reformation. Around 20 years later, John Calvin joined the growing Reformation, and his work would lead to the Reformed tradition of which we Presbyterians are part. Uh, Reformed teachings and Lutheran teachings shared much in common, but they diverged a great deal over the Lord's Supper. And as these two movements spread, they bumped into one another at the German town of Heidelberg. And tensions between the two groups worried the local ruler. And so this ruler asked a couple of prominent Christians to get together and come up with a theological statement that would be acceptable to both groups. And the result was the Heidelberg Catechism, 
published in 1563, and one of the faith documents in our Presbyterian book of confessions. Its banner is back there in the back. The first question in the catechism reads, what is your only comfort in life and in death? And the answer begins, that I belong, body and soul, in life and in death, not to myself, but to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. These words are echoed in a brief statement of faith, which is the most recently written of the faith statements in our book of confessions, the last banner over on this side. And it begins, in life and in death, we belong to God. I wonder if we recognize what countercultural statements those are. We're much more likely to hear the exact opposite. It's my money and I'll spend it on whatever I want. Or it's my life and I will decide what I'm going to do with it. We Americans value, we love our freedom and our autonomy. Those of my generation and older remember when the late Frank Sinatra used to sing, I did it my way. And millions of Americans would nod in agreement and hope that you could say the same thing about them. Even in our religious life, we tend to function as autonomous actors, choosing to participate because we find it beneficial or because we agree with the teachings. More rarely do we acknowledge the image of God that we bear that makes us God's own. If we did, if we routinely thought to ourselves, I am not my own, I belong body and soul and life and in death, not to myself, but to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ, well, then our, this year's stewardship theme of fearless giving probably would be unnecessary. If we truly thought that we belong to God, that everything we had belonged to God, it would likely not be so difficult for us to give even a tiny little bit of our money or our time to God. If we truly trusted that Jesus was the good shepherd who cares for us, the lambs of his flock, then we would probably not be perpetually worried about whether or not we have enough. Whose image is this on a coin, on me, and you? What is your only comfort your only hope, joy, assurance in life and in death. That I belong, body and soul, in life and in death, not to myself, but to my faithful Savior Jesus Christ, who gave absolutely everything for me for you. In gratitude, in love, let us give to God the things that are God's. All praise and glory to the God who claims us as God's own and calls us to new and abundant life as followers of Jesus the Christ.